from a diverse panel talking about diverse topics, all related to the question of how disputes should be resolved on a contract. Our first panelist is going to be Cayo Gaber de Alameda, who's going to be speaking on behalf of himself and Daniel Becker. They're going to be talking about the use of dispu dispute boards in contract and infrastructure industries. Then we will hear from Alan Blair. He's going to be talking about ordering, pr private ordering of dispute resolution mechanisms. He was trying to trip me up by changing his title, but I'm not going to <laughs> fall into that trap. I'll let him talk about that. Then we're going to hear from Alan, excuse me, from Benjamin Ponerantz. He's going to talk about arbitration and the question of mandatory, mandatory arbitration clauses in nursing home admissions contracts. So now we will hear from Kyle. So good morning, everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that we're very honored and thank you all for the opportunity of being uh, taking part on our very first panel. Uh, today we'll be speaking about dispute resolution boards and uh, actually about what kinds of pro what kinds of what kinds of problems uh, is Brazil and are Brazil and other developing countries facing the enforceability of the decisions of those boards and how um, the American, uh, English, and other common law countries' interpretation for, those, for the enforceability of these decisions may help us to improve um, all this background of uh, legal insecurity that's is, that is generated by the impossibility of enforcing such, such as decisions. First of all, uh, we'd like to present like the structure of how the speech will go. We'll start like with a quick, uh, quick scenario of the construction and infrastructure in industry in Brazil, and then we'll go to uh, the definitions of what a dispute resolution board really is, or how does it work. Uh, I'll try not to be that long on this part since it's actually uh, uh, an American institute and you probably are much more familiar with it than I do. So, and then we'll go through the, the whole problem of the enforceability of the decisions. Due to, in the last 20 years, due to the change of the national currency and a relative political stability, uh, political stability, which led to a, to a raise in the economic growth and increase of investments in Brazil, the, the research for new forms of energy the, the discovery of natural resources such as oil and gas and the, and the continuous growth of investments in engineering formations have, many industry se have led many industry sectors to reach that peak in Brazil. However, in this scenario, however, behind the rise of every building, every ship and every platform, we do know that there are a lot of technical, economical and human variables. Well. All of these variables that I've just listed, they, they, lead, they usually lead to a most certain result. Well, if we ask your founding father, Mr. Benjamin Franklin, what is this certain result? What is this certain side effect that we cannot escape from? He may have said death and taxes, right? Well, uh, it is clear to us now that Mr. Benjamin Franklin was no construction expert. Had he been a construction expert, he would probably have said death, taxes, and claims. <laughs> yeah, the complexity of those variables make it, for it, make, it, make, it in, make it impossible for us to achieve the completion of a, great, of a large project without having to face at least one or two claims along the way. So if you follow, at the same time we have a rising industry and an increased number of claims every day. Our, judi our judicial system is still, is, still, is still not ready. Is it still too slow? and inefficient. Uh, 
In this scenario, Brazilian legal and business communities are always trying to, are always seeking for more efficient and faster ways to resolve their controversies before they, before they, before they evolve into litigation. And in this scenario, we're always seeking for arbitration, for better arbitrations, uh, expert procedures, and dispute resolution boards. So, moving on to what is a dispute resolution board? The dispute resolution board is basically a panel of a panel of experts entrusted by the parties based on their expertise, their neutrality, and their impartiality and reliability. The panel will, this panel, choos, once chosen by the parties, will try to to advise the parties in the best way not to get into a dispute, and in some cases or most of cases, depending. On, on which region are, you, are we working with, the dispute resolution board will have the power to solve those controversies themselves before they reach litigation or arbitration. <coughs> so, we've, we've spoken about neutrality, expertise, and impartiality. It all sounds very arbitration-like, right? That's, that's, uh, that will be an important po point for where we're moving on next. However, there is one difference, there is one key difference between an, arbitra an, an, an arbitral tribunal and a dispute resolution board. The dispute resolution board will not just be summoned when the, when the dispute has, is at go. The dispute resolution board shall follow the, the execution of the works. In practice, what does it mean? In practice, the parties will, for, will execute the contract and put the clause providing for the existence of the, of the panel the existence, of the, the existence of the panel, the procedures, the applicable uh, rules of procedure, how long do you, you have to contest that decision, what are the powers of the, the dispute board, and all of that. Once they have discussed that, once they have agreed on that, they will also agree on the, reg on the regularity of the meetings, which means every 30, 45, or 60 days, the dispute resolution board will gather, will gather sit with the party's representatives, and, pr and perform a hearing. They will collect evidence, they will see reports, they will follow the execution of the work, they will acknowledge if there is any trouble, what is that trouble, how can we solve it, or how you must solve it. By, so at the end of that, at the end of those analysis, the dispute board will issue a decision, which may be a deci decision-like or more like a recommendation that we'll see right up next. So there are basically three types of dispute resolution board decisions. The first type, it's a non-binding recommendation, which is not properly a decision, it's just a recommendation. As name says, it's non-binding. The parties may follow, follow it or not at will and move on, or move on to the next dispute resolution step, whether it is uh, courts or arbitration or mediation or wherever they have provided. Now, category number two, which is uh, most, one of the most important, in my opinion, is an interim binding decision. An interim binding decision, as the name says, is not final, it's just interim, which means, meaning that once the parties have received that decision, the losing party has, has, a, has, a dead, has a deadline to contest it, to contest it and then move on to the next uh, dispute resolution step, which, which probably will be arbitration or uh, courts, but most likely arbitration. So at that point, the arbitrators or the courts, they are not entitled to enforce that decision or just take a formal analysis of it. At, the, at this point, the tribunal will have to go through all the merits of the case once again. However, the interim binding decision is binding until the, final, until the issuance of the final decision. Which means, if the losing party does not comply with the, with, the, with the dispute board's decision until the final decision of the of the arbitral tribunal or the court, the winning party may require uh, cautionary measures and losses and damages for the non-compliance with that decision until a uh, until the issuance of a final one. Now, move on, moving on to cat category number three decisions. Category number three decisions, the uncontested decisions, are basically the cat category number two decisions which were not contested in, within the deadline. After a decision is not contested in the deadline, 
she loses she loses le, her inter, interim character she will become final she will become final since the party since the party has chosen not to uh, not to contest it within the deadline provided in the contract after that the court any court or arbitral tribunal that that analyzes that decision shall not go through all the merits of the case again they should only look in they should only look into the into those um, into those categories into those aspects of the of decisions which make them void a court as if they were an, uh, an arbitral award which makes which if you think about it makes the possibilities of avoiding that decision quite narrower you only have you only have to go through arbitrary uh, dispute board members uh, corruption impartiality if they respected due procedure of the due procedure of the of the dispute board if the other part if the if the parties had uh, all their contradictory rights respected and all of that <laughs> so it's an, it's the problem our actual problem lives on that that these last kind of decisions the uncontested ones and we'll see right about we'll see why right about now which is some some legal systems do not accept this enforceable power this binding power this final binding power of the uncontested decisions for example in brazil and other civil law countries especially the ones we're now developing this kind of alternative dispute resolution methods we have about three problems the first one is the lack of legal legal provision no no laws or decrees were ever issued about dispute resolution boards or any other or most of any other alternative dispute resolution methods except arbitration of course but in most of countries especially common law countries this fact should not be a problem because you have a broader broader interpretation of laws and a more and more possibilities of uh, accepting such such measures however in brazil the lack of legal provision allied to a very strict civil law system will not allow um, brazilian authorities to have a broader interpretation of the a broader interpretation of uh, adrs such as arbitration or the Arbitra arbitration act I mean is they are mostly restrained, especially in procedural matters. They are mostly restrained to the to the codified law. To the, codif to the codified law, they will not go over it, especially in procedural matters, because that's where that's where our constitutional principles of access, free access to justice, contradictory, right for defense. That's that's all very delicate. It's not only a matter of public policies; it's actually a matter of constitutional order, which does not allow broader interpretations and skipping any any steps or of a of a due procedure of law. So, our co because of that, our courts become very conservative. In this cons in this conservative way, they are most likely to repel any attempt to create anything that, in their view, is an attempt to create a private jurisdiction. So we have all these problems that which are basically uh, formed by a very conservative and civil law oriented way, way of thinking. And uh, we believe that the solution for that lies within a more common law and a more common law uh, approach of the case. So which is which brought us to to look into the American interpretation, which was uh, afterwards, um, spread into into the into all basically all common law system, which is basically a broad interpretation of Section Two of the Federal Arbitration Act. So, basically, what the, what we ask here is what uh, American scholars or uh, judges or courts will would ask here is what is arbitration. The law doesn't clearly states, doesn't clearly define what is arbitration. What uh, it actually does give you uh, where to end and where to start. For example, isn't arbitration just uh, just uh, the autonomy of the parts to solve their to solve their 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 dispute 
through a third party to, to delegate that power, that jurisdiction to a third party. So a, as we have said before, the dispute resolution boards, aren't they based on a, pros, uh, on a procedure, on a due procedure? Aren't they based on the neutrality, the impartiality of the, of the evaluators? Aren't they based on the party's autonomy? So why couldn't that be? Why couldn't, why couldn't the, the dispute board decision be matched to, uh, to an arbitral award? That would totally go in favor of the economy, the economy of, the, of the procedure and to the, to the right satisfaction of the will of the, of the parties. Now, if you please take a look and take just a, a few seconds to, to go into the, this translation of the, also the section two of the Brazilian arbitration law, perhaps seeing if you agree to interpret it with me, that this device will give us, would give us the chance to do exactly the same comparison, ex exactly the same line of thought. The parties are free to choose the rules applicable to the arbitration, provided that do not violate public policies and good practices. If I can choose how's my, how my procedures will look like, what are the, um, the base grounds to it, to it, why can I just call, basically call a dispute board resolution of an arbitral award and match their effects and make them become enforceable and binding? So and any court that would enforce the, that decision would just have to look in through the, in through the, uh, into the aspects that are common to a, an arbitral award. The corruption, corruption, impartiality, respect of the procedure, and access to justice. So, in this sense, we believe we, we although we know there's a still a long way to go before this reaches the courts, before this kind of understanding reaches reaches and moves the courts, we believe that um, through academical incentive and through a large. Um, and through a, and a large uh, study of, the, of those principles, of those, that analogy and of common law principles and common law flexibility, most of all, we can make the courts believe, we can make the courts to think differently, to be more open-minded, creating, creating an environment of more legal stability to, to, industries and to industry sectors, which are now most important, most impo of most importance, not only to Brazil, but to all other developing countries like like in Africa, South Middle East, uh, and South in Southern East Asia, uh, and through that, and through that, make a a more stable environment for economical development. So uh, thank you for the th thank you for borrowing the interpretation, and thank you now for the academical incentive. We will now hear from Professor Blair. Hi. I never use PowerPoint, so my first apology is going to be that this is not going to be as pretty as it would be if I got to use my Mac. But uh, uh, my second apology has to do with my title. As you can see, I have a slightly different title than appears in the brochure. And in thinking about the title that appears in the brochure, I uh, was told by my wife when we arrived here because she saw the brochure that it actually sounded like I was a lolcat. I did not know what a lolcat was until she showed me internet memes. So if you don't know what a lolcat is, then this joke will be lost on you. <laughs> but for my uh, part, I apologize that I did not uh, look at the brochure, even though there were multiple drafts that went out. It is most certainly not uh, Jennifer Martin's fault at all. She's been wonderful in organizing a lot of balls. All I can say is that I was much more, uh, 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 I was appealed by all of the diverse range of topics that all the rest of you were presenting and didn't pay much attention to my own topics title. Anyway, it was a typo. Uh, the draft of my paper now is uh, uh, talking about customization of procedure through contract. And uh, the, though the title has changed, the basic topic has not. So to start off with, let me uh, uh, talk about some basic terminology. 
Uh, what I'm talking about is customized procedure. The, there are a variety of scholars who talk about this under other labels. You might think about contract procedure, procedural contract, private procedural ordering, bespoke procedure, one of my favorites, uh, and customized litigation. These different labels are all talking about a very similar phenomena, although some commentators wind up carving out uh, bits and pieces of the phenomena in different ways. So for instance, customized litigation is trying to focus on the notion that uh, what we're thinking about as a problem is something different than arbitration. I use the term in its most capacious uh, sense possible. I am thinking about, for my purposes, any contract provision that promotes, or purports rather, to provide dispute resolution rules or processes that will apply in a future adjudication of a fight. So it covers arbitration, it covers form selection clauses, it covers choice of law clauses. Most certainly there is a range of uh, uh, controversy. So some of these things are at this point in history not controversial at all. Choice of law, form provision clauses, those are pretty uncontroversial for most of us and by most scholars. Moving to slightly more controversial perhaps arbitration at least in uh, disparate party contexts and maybe even things like uh, doing away with the discovery rule or other common law limits on uh, statutes of limitations. Obviously limiting statute of limitations can be done within substantive law provisions, but uh, doing away with discovery uh, uh, rules or those sorts of things is maybe more controversial, all the way to the most controversial of, discover, of procedure, customized procedure, which might be things like uh, changing burdens of proof or changing the standard, the quantum of evidence required in a burden of proof. Um, or doing away with appeal rights or limiting the grounds on which an appeal might be had within a court process. So I think about all of these things as customized procedure and in that regard I'm not alone. Many, many scholars, or, or a, I won't say many, there's an explosion of sorts, a mini little explosion of scholars who are interested in this subject at least recently. The, the subject's not brand new. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, certainly concern over things like forum selection clauses is not new. It's a, uh, an ancient concern in the law. But calling it contract procedure is relatively new. I date it, although you can find some earlier references, I dated to Judith Resnick's great article in 2000 uh, called Contract Procedure. But there are other uh, glimpses here and there, particularly in certain contexts. So I always like what I'm thinking about. Oh, that looks terrible on here again. Sorry, yeah, it's PowerPoint. I, I feel so bad for people who don't have Keynote. Uh, so I feel bad for myself now. I always like when I'm thinking about a presentation to give you a glimpse of how I came to the topic and what interested me at the beginning. And I always think of uh, good papers as having a puzzle at the core of them, some sort of a puzzle. There were several puzzles for me, uh, and this all came about during my sabbatical. Uh, this last year. During my sabbatical, I, I started to become fascinated with the Supreme Court's decision in Hall Street and Associates, an arbitration decision where essentially the court said that parties could not contract for uh, or contract out of judicial review of their arbitral awards. So there had been a, a, you know, a good deal of interest, in, and I would say this was something of a hot topic at the time, parties wanting to do away with, uh, or, or I'm sorry, not do away with, rather contract into uh, judicial review for their arbitral awards. Why would they do this? Well, parties argued that it was because they had bet the farm cases, significant enough stakes that they wanted a second bite uh, at getting the right outcome, getting an accurate outcome. So contracting for higher standards of judicial review was something that parties wanted. Puzzlingly, to me at least, the Supreme Court said you can't do it. Uh, the Supreme Court said that our, uh, Section 10 of the FAA was the exclusive uh, uh, and mandatory means of reviewing arbitral awards. That's the whole ball game, that's it. Well, that seemed to buck a lot of other prior Supreme Court law on arbitration and procedural contracting more generally, where the court seems to have engaged in an unfettered march towards recognizing the ability of parties to craft their own procedures. So it's puzzling. Hall Street was puzzling to me, and I began to think about what Hall Street does. One could read Hall Street, and some commentators have, as a, uh, a cautionary tale, as a recognition that there are some things about the judicial process or about judicial procedure that are sacrosanct, that parties do not have complete control over dispute resolution, and that despite freedom of contract, there have got to be some limits.
I was skeptical of that because I scour the Supreme Court's decision in Hall Street and I see no reference to the sanctity of the judicial process. I see no reference to the court, uh, uh, even though there were pre-existing uh, cases that talked about that. Even Judge Richard Posner, who might be someone uh, more favorable to my position here that uh, uh, we should treat the rules of dispute resolution as defaults. Even Judge Posner talked about the fact that parties shouldn't, sh should only have some limited control over judicial procedure, yet the Supreme Court made no mention of it. So it was puzzling to me. And the second puzzle that uh, I was concerned with was that despite it seeming like a really good idea, giving parties the option to customize their procedure, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, besides seeming like a really good idea from the party's perspective anyway, giving them greater flexibility to maximize their joint surplus from contracting, we don't see as much of it as we might expect. Um, now, I argue in a separate paper, in a different paper, that, that maybe we're looking at the wrong thing when we say that, but there are a number of scholars who have, uh, most recently David Horton in, in uh, an article called Wither Bespoke Contract, he argues, look, we just don't see the phenomena. This is a big flash in the pan because parties aren't contracting for procedure. That's not true. Obviously, if you take a more capacious view of contract procedure, we do contract for arbitration, we do contract for forum selection, we do contract for choice of law. That happens all the time. What he means is we don't see more customization than those traditional means. I am taking then those two puzzles and trying to do something with them. I assume for purposes of this paper that in fact uh, procedure is a, a, a default, that the rules of procedure are defaults. Now I say I assume that, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the doctrinal landscape and why I assume that that's the case, but I think that the march f towards the Supreme Court of the United States and other courts recognizing procedure as defaults has been a, a, a unfettered, that there has been no case, including Hall Street, that goes a different direction. In fact, the court has just repeatedly uh, expanded and expanded the range of freedom that parties have over their procedure. So viewing procedural rules as defaults then obligates somebody to think about two questions. Well, fundamental to default rules are two, two basic questions. Is a particular rule of procedure in this case mandatory or, or is it alterable? And if it's alterable, I should say as sort of a subpart to that, how alterable is it? And then, if it's alterable, what are the mechanisms? How do you go about altering it? To date, most scholarship hasn't really considered these two questions expressly, but has considered the first question in one guise or another, has thought about what rules are alterable, and specifically has done so by thinking about what the, the normative concerns with contract procedure might be. I, I, in, in doing it, most scholars have thought about this from the perspective of system designers or from lawmakers, from courts or from legislators thinking about procedural contracting as sort of a, a phenomena that is external to the parties. I take a different view of this and following Victor Goldberg, one of my mentors at Columbia, I, I sort of look at this from the position of the contracting parties. What would the parties want out of contract procedure? Thinking about these questions from their perspective, I wind up coming to some different conclusions. So in a nutshell, I say, uh, uh, seeing procedures as default, or at least seeing the potential for them to be, I consider these two fundamental questions, and I say the range of things that parties are likely to contract over is much smaller than some uh, commentators have assumed. That explains in many ways this phenomena of parties not contracting into a bunch of different procedures because they wouldn't rationally want to do that in most cases, that the range of, of what they would contract over is smaller. The range of customization itself is also smaller. And then that leads me to the, the question of, well, then how much have we reduced these normative concerns simply by the reality that parties aren't going to do that much customization? How much have the normative questions sort of dissipated? I say quite a bit. And what remains, I think, can be addressed by uh, making defaults sticky rather than prescribing or prohibiting customization of contracts entirely. So I start with the doctrinal background. I'll do a very quick sort of summary of the doctrinal law. Then I think about the first question and the second question a little bit. So doctrine. The doctrine governing procedural contracting is uh, complicated. The history, though, in a nutshell, follows a pretty uh, simple pattern. Courts, historically, were very protective of their turf, uh, and they saw any efforts at procedural contracting or procedural private procedural ordering as impeding their proper public function. That included arbitration, of course. So there was uh, the, the original doctrine uh, uh, comes from the UK in a number of uh, cases. There are two very famous ones that 
uh, introduced it, first the revocability doctrine, which was expressly about arbitration. Anybody who studied arbitration knows about the revocability and ouster doctrine, so I'm not going to talk about them a lot here, but simply it suffices to say that courts start with arbitration, say, uh, sure, you can enter into a compact to arbitrate, but you can revoke it at any time you want before the arbitration uh, result is rendered, which basically made arbitration meaningless and unenforceable because parties could get out of it any time they wanted. That translated then eventually into, and, th and there are some reasons to be skeptical of that original doctrine. I talk about it a little bit in the paper, but for now, courts read that decision as being revocability at any time before an arbitral award was rendered. That transmuted into the ouster doctrine, which said essentially that private parties couldn't oust a court of their jurisdiction, couldn't oust courts of their proper jurisdiction, and jurisdiction being read in a, in a wide, expansive sense. That became really a general judicial hostility to any efforts to customize procedure. So courts wound up saying things to the United States Supreme Court in a very famous case, uh, Morse, in the insurance case, wound up saying that an insurance company could not waive its right to remove a case from state court into federal court, that a waiver of that right would constitute an ouster of the court's proper public function. Uh, notably, the case was, uh, you know, between seemingly sophisticated people negotiating over sophisticated things. There was no disparate party concern, and at the time, that wasn't a big part of contract law doctrine anyway, no unconscionability doctrine, but none of those concerns seemed to be there. The court was doing this on grounds of uh, protecting its turf, its traditional turf. That eventually gives way, of course, to a greater demand for arbitration by commercial parties. The FAA in the early 1920s being enacted, uh, the FAA, of course, for those of you who study arbitration, is ridiculously spare. It says hardly anything. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it means hardly anything by itself. The Supreme Court then lays dormant for many, many years until the Supreme Court winds up uh, 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 renovating the doctrine, basically creating a whole new doctrine that is common law, federal common law. The statute does very little work. But ultimately, we wind up having uh, this resurgence of arbitration and with it resurgence of other sorts of procedural contracting norms. For purposes of this, I say the most important of these renovations or these uh, changes came in the Bremen uh, where the Supreme Court says that a form selection clause is enforceable and expressly, well, it doesn't expressly actually, but it, it says that the ouster doctrine is a vestige of uh, antiquated law citing to Morse ouster doctrine and judicial hostility to procedural contracting has gone on two big points from the Bremen. Outside of doing away with the ouster doctrine, it puts in the hands of contracting parties. It, it makes the touchstone of procedure the contracting party's bargaining process, not due process. So it translates uh, any concerns about a public process into concerns about how good the bargaining process was from the parties. If the parties have good enough bargaining process, then the court's not going to scrutinize that. I think that basic fundamental thread then runs through all of the Supreme Court's arbitration jurisprudence, which I'm going to spare you from walking through now, and simply say the court seems to have replaced concerns about due process with concerns about, uh, about con contracting process and replaced procedure with contract in some sense. I think we're going to hear a little bit more about FAA as contract or procedure in a bit. Normative concerns are raised, however, about treating judicial process as contractable or customizable. And those normative concerns, there are a variety of them, and I, I survey these normative concerns. Justice Kaczynski, in a famous case dealing with Hall Street, a precursor to Hall Street, once said that he would be very concerned about customization of procedure if it amounted to a judge being asked to flip a coin or study the entrails of dead fowl to make a decision. Uh, setting aside colorful examples like Judge Kaczynski's, the normative concerns are sort of, uh, I argue, kind of bundled into four categories. Disparate party contracts. Uh, people raise, of course, the same concerns that you raise with arbitration, that disparate parties are going to wind up getting squashed by more powerful parties who are going to use uh, contracts, contracts to uh, uh, insulate themselves from substantive claims. That's somewhat related to uh, uh, the next one, which is the procedural machinations even outside of the disparate party contract context might be used to gain covert substantive advantages. The, the main point here from most commentators is that uh, 
it's hard sometimes to know what impact substance is going to have or a procedure is going to have on substance. We know that they're related. We don't buy anymore, or most people don't buy anymore, the rigid uh, dichotomy between substance and procedure. We know that they're interrelated, but it's complicated to know how they're interrelated, and parties might be able to uh, covertly sneak in an advantage through the procedural back door without anybody noticing. The other uh, concern is that procedural customization is going to undermine the structural role of private enforcement. In the United States in particular, we rely on private parties to bring uh, actions in order to effectuate public uh, goals, public good goals. We have, I mean, even if we don't expressly call them private attorney general's actions, we look to private parties to enforce public goals a lot. And this uh, notion of customizing procedure might have a detrimental impact on this uh, role of private enforcement. And finally, procedural customization could impede the flow of positive information to future parties. This is an externalities problem, a uh, positive externalities problem, where we say, look, precedent's good. Precedent matters. And if you take things uh, uh, outside of courts, this is a common argument with arbitration. If you allow parties to opt out of the public system, you do away with precedent. But you could have a similar argument with customizing procedure. If you make the precedent uh, so much dependent on a unique and, and idiosyncratic procedure, then the precedent doesn't mean anything for future cases, or it might even be worse, it might become confusing. You might think it matters for your case, but really it was more dependent on an idiosyncratic procedure that wouldn't apply in your case anyway. So you could have these uh, problems with positive externalities. Basically, I boil these down into process concerns, outcome concerns, concerns about externalities, and concerns about perceived legitimacy. In all of these cases, I say that, look, if we think about the normative, uh, uh, assuming that all of these are very valid concerns, if we think about the range of customization that parties are going to want, I think that we can limit the impact of these normative concerns. So I build a non-formal model of uh, choice, of choice over customization, and I'm not going to walk through the model in great detail simply because of time, but the, the basic constituent components are, of course, at the beginning, and there's nothing magical about the model. I mean, this model isn't, isn't revolutionary by any sense, but hopefully it identifies some of the key considerations that parties are going to go through in deciding whether to customize. A default is only going to, you're only going to alter a default if you get net gains that outweigh the net costs, right? I mean, that, that's pretty basic stuff. In thinking about the costs, of course, there are specification costs and error co costs. The specification costs is really important for purposes of my analysis because it breaks down into several uh, uh, subcategories. Specification costs include uh, uh, or are related to what I think of as the uh, idiosyncrasy party problem. The more idiosyncrasy the uh, um, procedure that you want to have is, the more difficult or more expensive it's going to be to customize that procedure. So there's a relationship between those things. And I say that you know parties are unlikely, ultimately, to customize too much outside of the norm because the cost goes way up and error costs increase. In addition, specification costs mean that you've got to convince your contracting party to buy this. To, to accept this term, and the more idiosyncrasy it is, the more unlikely it is that uh, your party is going to accept. That's a cost, if you will. All of those things then lead to uh, uh, the fact that benefits have to be measured against the baseline of what the defaults are. And the baseline of what the defaults are, I say, are pretty good in the most, for the most part, for a variety of reasons, the most important of which is that parties operate under sort of a veil of ignorance on the front end of their disputes. They don't know what likely will benefit them procedurally. The existing rules of procedure are, are pretty much as good as anything that the parties are likely going to contract for, leaving the, the, the range of things that you're going to contract over much smaller, I think, than some uh, uh, commentators have suggested. And if you're going to customize, most likely you're going to customize in ways that make the dispute resolution pro process simpler for adjudicators, not more complicated. I think that remo removes or takes care of a number of uh, normative concerns. And because I'm out of time, I will just say that with respect to what remains, my paper then argues that we can fix most of what remains by simply making defaults stickier rather than prescribing or eliminating uh, procedural contracting altogether. Thank you. It may not be looking like it, but I am taking time, watching the time and 
<laughs> getting the hook ready. Just a brief um, note, a low cat is a, photo a photograph of a cat with text that's intended to contribute humor. And Professor Blair's um, PowerPoint began with a low, ca low cat. So, because I didn't know what, because I didn't know what it was either, so I looked it up. I had no idea. My wife tells me that low cats have a propensity to uh, uh, talk in a very odd manner, which is why the title. So. Being cats, of course, they don't speak proper English. <laughs> okay, we now hear from Professor Pomerantz, who's also going to talk about the FAA. Good morning. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Professor Martin and everyone else here at St. Thomas made this, this conference possible. It's been a real pleasure to be here for the last couple of days learning from so many people, so thank you for that. And thank you for the weather, too. I'm from upstate New York, and coming down here, I think I'm still in uh, sunshine shock, so it's very nice. Like everyone else here on this panel, I'm interested in talking about dispute resolution by contract. But in my case, through a very narrow lens, a very specific lens, this idea of admissions contracts for nursing homes and the use of agreements for binding arbitration contained within those contracts. My purpose here is not to praise or criticize arbitration as a whole, but instead to look more at the idea of choice, the idea of meaningful choice and making certain that parties in this unique circumstance of the nursing home admission context are not deprived of that choice, either intentionally or unintentionally, whether to arbitrate or not to arbitrate as they go forward in a dispute against the nursing home. So we start with our model plaintiff, Pauline Ouellet, and her case sort of epitomizes the kind of case that has become very common in this area and appeared in many, many state courts for the last two decades. Older woman suffers from many ailments. Her daughter is also ill, can no longer take care of her. Doctor recommends admission to a nursing home for skilled long-term care. And the daughter finds a nursing home that seems appropriate and actually has bed space available. Goes to the nursing home. And the admissions agreement from the nursing home is this 73-page document. And on pages 35 and 36 in that document is an arbitration agreement saying that any dispute brought against the nursing home for an action for wrongful death or an action for personal injury must be resolved by binding arbitration. And it applies to Miss Willette, to the person being admitted, and to her successors and assigns. So in the nursing home, things go wrong very quickly. Over the course of five weeks, Miss Willette loses weight at an alarming rate, develops severe infections, becomes quote, withdrawn and lethargic, according to the nursing home's own assessment of her. And finally, she is sent to the hospital. The doctors find her to be severely dehydrated, suffering from a host of illnesses. Three days later, she dies. Daughter wants to sue the nursing home for wrongful death, saying they were negligent in their, in their care of, of her mother. She wants to go to court. Nursing home says no. Why? Because they pull out that nursing home agreement and they say, look, right here on pages 35 and 36, you signed away your right to go to court. You have to go to binding arbitration. The nursing home moves to dismiss the case and compel arbitration. What defense is raised? Unconscionability. And I have the quote here from the Walker Thomas Furniture Company case, one of the seminal cases, I guess you could say, in this area looking at unconscionability. It's one of several definitions that are out there, but I think it, it captures it pretty well. The idea of an absence of meaningful choice on one party's side, coupled with contract terms that are unreasonably, un, uh, unreasonably favorable to the stronger party in the situation. And of course, this becomes an uphill battle for anyone trying to avoid enforcement of the contract by arguing unconscionability because you have all these comments from judges and from commentators saying why this doctrine is so slippery and impossible to define and all these, these critiques of it. The, even the, the famous uh, Justice Potter Stewart idea, they, they know unconscionability when they see it. Right? The, the concept of it being so flexible you can't possibly pin it down, making it very difficult to argue and win 
in court. Well, here's what happens with Ms. Roulette's case, which is what makes unconscionability the argument that has to be used in these cases. Her case goes to the Supreme Court of Appeals in West Virginia. It's, it's joined with two others and sent to the, to the highest court in the state. The highest court in the state says, under state public policy, any arbitration agreement in a nursing home admissions contract regarding future personal injury or wrongful death claims, okay, so a pre-dispute arbitration agreement in the nursing home context is unenforceable across the board. Nursing home appeals to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, and they reverse West Virginia. And they do so by saying any absolute ban or any categorical ban on arbitration by a state violates the Federal Arbitration Act. And they, they take this language very similar to the language you see in the um, Concepcion case, AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion, when state law prohibits outright the arbitration of a particular type of claim, the conflicting rule is displaced by the FAA. So a little bit of, of reversal and background. The FAA was passed in 1925 under the idea of reversing the long-standing judicial hostility to arbitration, taking arbitration agreements and putting them on equal footing with any other type of contract. And in particular, for these cases, you look at FAA's Section 2, the idea of the arbitration agreement being valid, irrevocable, and enforceable, save upon grounds in law or equity for the revocation of any contract. So if you have grounds in law or equity that can, can revoke any contract, that's fine, but any specific ban on arbitration is not okay. So, to echo Professor Blair, for many years, the Supreme Court lay dormant in this area of law. And then in the 1980s, the sleeping giant wakes up, and the, the slew of cases comes down where the Supreme Court seems to be broadening their interpretation of the FAA. And most importantly in this, in these cases in the 80s and beyond, the US Supreme Court says that the FAA can preempt state law. Prior to that, a state law forbidding arbitra arbitration in a certain area was seen as okay. The Supreme Court let that go. After this, the, this group of cases in the 1980s and afterward, the FAA is held to preempt state law. And that becomes very important for these nursing home cases because as we saw in the, the 2011 case with Ms. Ouellette, the FAA now can be used to say you cannot have a policy or a law that bans arbitration in the nursing home context. That's in violation of the FAA. And there have been attempts around this by Congress. Those have, have failed thus far. There was one in 2011, one in 2012. Both died in committee. There currently is an Arbitration Fairness Act that was introduced uh, by Al Franken, which is under consideration. We'll see how far that goes. Most likely it will not go very far if past history is any indication. And on the state level, attempts to, to pass laws around this have all failed because of this preemption concept. So you have Illinois, you have New Jersey, you have California, all trying to pass laws. And Oklahoma had a, had a major dispute about this about five years ago. And they, they would pass these laws, then the courts would overturn it, or in the case of California, Governor Schwarzenegger vetoed it. And in his veto memo specifically referenced the FAA as his reason for striking down this particular law banning arbitration agreements in nursing homes. So generally this is going to leave you with an unconscionability argument. There are some cases out there where an agency argument is used, as a bunch from, from Mississippi actually, where the, you say, okay, the, the person who signed this agreement did not have the actual authority or the apparent authority to bind the plaintiff. But the majority of these cases now are coming down to unconscionability. And so because there's this issue about vagueness, and chameleon-like nature of this doctrine of unconscionability, the question becomes, what can somebody arguing unconscionability in a nursing home case hang their hat on? Can we determine common criteria in these cases? And looking at about 20 years of, of cases, I think there are some things that we can at least use for a starting point. So starting with procedural unconscionability, the idea of, of injustice in the bargaining process or the contract formation. The idea of lack of capacity or competence, okay, the lack of sophistication of the parties is a common phrase used. The length of the admissions contract, thinking back to Ms. Ouellette, 73 pages long. 
pretty long agreement. The idea of is the agreement standing alone, a separate document handed to the person signing it, or is it buried somewhere within the admissions packet? Is it required as a condition for admission? Do you have to actually sign off on this to have your loved one admitted to the nursing home? Or is this something which is optional but not required for admission? That makes a big difference in these cases. Is there any kind of explanation, hopefully an accurate one, by nursing home staff to the signer about what this agreement means, what they're actually signing, and what the consequences can be down the road? Is there any kind of pressure put on the individual by the nursing home staff? And what is the level of the medical necessity of the person who is seeking the admission? Is this something where there truly is no meaningful alternative because not getting admitted to the home right away could mean severe aggravation of disability or even death? And so a couple of cases to look at. And this is just a few of many of them. We start in our, our host state of Florida, the idea of competence and sophistication of the parties looms large in this one. The husband is elderly, had memory loss apparently, no legal training or background with these types of contracts, and the nursing home never tells him that his wife can stay there as a resident even if he didn't agree to arbitration. That was their policy. It was an optional, an optional policy, but they never told him that. He thought that he had to sign this agreement or else she couldn't get admission to the nursing home. In Michigan, similar type of issue, we, we have an individual who suffered some dementia on medications. The document was 13 pages long, seen as pretty complex. The arbitration clause was in very small type on the 11th page. The court said, no, that, that's procedural unconscionability in that situation. Tennessee, one of the major cases that's really cited quite a bit, this Howell case, where the, the resident was in urgent need of skilled care, had a, a whole series of um, severe ailments needing immediate skilled nursing attention. And the nursing home said that they would not admit her until her husband signed the agreement. That was their policy. On top of that, the husband could neither read nor write. And the arbitration clause was, again, in kind of the fine print here, on page 10 of an 11-page contract. The Tennessee High Court said, no, this is procedurally unconscionable. We're not going to hold this to be an enforceable contract. And you saw this on remand in the West Virginia case, after the Supreme Court said, no, the FAA says you cannot have an absolute ban, sends it back to the high court in West Virginia. They go back and they find this agreement to be procedurally unconscionable. The fact that the daughter was sick herself under extreme stress, the immediacy of the nursing home care for the mother, and very importantly, there were other nursing homes in the region, but there was no evidence presented that they had any available bed space. So there are facilities out there but there was nothing presented to show that there was actually space for an individual to become a resident there. And then, of course, the fact that the signing was required for admission to the nursing home. You had to agree to this pre-dispute arbitration. Kind of on the flip side, in Massachusetts in 2007, you have the Miller case, where the nursing home representatives verbally summarize the arbitration clause to the son before the son signs on behalf of his father. And they told the son, if you don't sign this, we will still admit your father to our facility. And most importantly, sophistication of the parties. The son had a 27-year career in the insurance industry. He had an understanding prior to this of arbitration agreements and how they work. Now, there are some outliers, of course. This doctrine of unconscionability still is very much a flexible doctrine. And you see this, this outlier concept in the Leddit case in Texas. One of the strangest cases in this area, I think, where the son spoke only Spanish, read only Spanish. The nursing home brought out a Spanish-speaking interpreter to talk to the son, told the son some information, but the arbitration agreement was never discussed at all in this dialogue between the nursing home and the son. The son signs the agreement, believing that he has to sign the whole thing for his, um, his father to be admitted to the nursing home. Later on, the, the father dies. There's some dispute about how the father was treated. The son wants to sue for wrongful death. The nursing home says, no, you signed this agreement. And the High Court of Texas says, even though the son spoke only Spanish, read only Spanish, and the interpreter who was speaking to him in Spanish did not describe anything about this agreement and what it meant, it still was an enforceable agreement and arbitration could be compelled.
from what I could tell, that's a real outlier in this area. I could find no other cases that could really echo those types of facts and circumstances. And then quickly, on the substantive side, a couple of categories there. One, the idea of tilting the scales too much. So requiring the losing party in arbitration to pay all costs and fees of the arbitration. Courts tend to look very unfavorably on that. Preventing recovery of punitive damages or an unreasonably low cap in the court's judgment on damages awarded or an unreasonably short statute of limitations than what's required by law. Different things being put in place that, that limit the recovery or the ability to get access that, that the court says, okay, that, that in the contract terms itself is unconscionable. And this idea of lack of bilaterality comes up quite often, and we'll see that in the case coming up in just a few minutes. And then the other idea, the idea of an unreasonable burden. Would the plaintiff be forced to bear unreasonable expenses at arbitration? And we'll see that in an Arizona case that I'll talk about in a couple of slides. So the idea of tilting the scales too much. In New Mexico, we have this idea of bilaterality coming into play, where any disputes against the facility regarding personal injury or wrongful death had to go to arbitration. But any disputes regarding discharge of the resident, like a forcible discharge of the resident, or collection of payments, overdue money, for facility services could go to court. And the court said, well, wait a second, that's, that, that, that's substantively unconscionable because you're saying disputes brought by the, the resident or the resident's agent, those have to go to arbitration. But the disputes that you, the facility, would want to bring for a collection of overdue payments or for forcible discharge of a resident, that gets to go to court if you want. That was seen by, by the New Mexico court and many other courts in similar circumstances as substantively unconscionable, unfairness in the contract terms itself. Ohio, you had this idea of the loser pays provision. The court said that could be a chilling effect on plaintiffs who wanted to bring these cases. The fear that if you lost, you would have to pay your fees and the nursing home's fees as well. A couple of Florida cases, one saying no punitive damages could be awarded, one saying that non-economic damages had to be capped at $250,000. Both of those were held to be unenforceable, substantively unconscionable. And the idea of an undue burden on the, re on the resident or an agent. This was, was epitomized uh, last year in an Arizona case, the Clark case, where there was expert testimony brought before the court estimating the arbitrator's fees as at least $22,800. And the resident who would want to bring this case, 88 years old, had a monthly fixed income of $4,600. And the court said, no, that's substantively unconscionable. It could effectively bar this person from getting access to justice because they would not be able to pay the arbitrator's fees to bring this case before an arbitrator. And then, again, going back to West Virginia, you saw this again. The nursing home, no modicum of bilaterality. The home could bring a proceeding in any form court or arbitration to collect overdue payments or forcible discharge, but the resident was limited to binding arbitration to resolve claims. And the filing fees are also held to be a gross disparity, 145 versus 975 and higher, where it could be seen as an effective bar to gaining access to justice for the resident. And so you see, although it's not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, and it's not a concrete doctrine by any stretch of the imagination, there is at least enough factors that you can find here on which a person who is trying to, to seek unenforceability of a contract in the nursing home context could argue. And a couple of, of brief last words. That we have these, these common criteria that do stand out. If unconscionability is a doctrine that we're going to be taking seriously at all in our legal system, these cases would seem to be particularly compelling, mostly because right now there's nothing you can have the lawmakers really do because anything that they, they will try to do at the state level is going to be preempted by the FAA. If Congress does something, that's one thing, but that's pretty unlikely from what we've seen, and the states are all going to be preempted each time they try by the FAA. And the one common factor you see throughout this that I, that I think you can find is if the nursing home seems to be seeking to avoid accountability for their actions through arbitration then the arbitration clause should not be enforced. If it's a straight up arbitration clause agreed to where meaningful choice is present, then it should be enforceable. 
But if there's a situation like we've seen in the cases here, where it was not enforced, where the nursing home seems to be hiding the ball in some way, or creating an undue advantage for themselves, that's where unconscionability should take its rightful place, and the arbitration clause should not be enforced. Thank you. And lastly, but not least, we're going to hear from Professor Aragaki. Okay, uh, I thought I would have these slides to show you, but I don't want to waste any more time uh, with the presentation. So I know we're uh, very short uh, now on minutes, so let me just kind of dive right into it. Um, I think it's fortuitous the timing of, of our presentations because um, what I'm hearing from Professor Blair is, you know, contract procedures, great, you know, consent, contract. And what I'm hearing from Professor Pomerantz is, well, contract maybe not so great, you know. Um, and uh, what I think I'm saying is, I'm not sure that contract is the right frame. I'm not even sure that contract is that relevant. Um, and so this is a kind of question that I want to raise uh, to everyone. So as we heard uh, before, you know, there is this, um, this conception of the FAA as a pro-contract statute, a statute that tried you know, in, the, in the 1920s to liberate merchants from substantive regulation, to allow them to order themselves in the way they saw fit. And uh, this is translated into this principle uh, in the court that the purpose of the FAA is really to enforce private arbitration agreements as they're written. You know, let's not second guess that. Um, and in my other work, uh, which I'm not really going to talk about here because I think it's less interesting to this audience, uh, has, has been to kind of reconstruct that history and say, actually, that contract model of the FAA is misleading and probably incorrect. The FAA actually uh, shares much more in common with the procedural law reform movement spearheaded by people like uh, Roscoe Pound, and that eventually led to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, and that entire history has been completely overlooked. Um, but uh, that, that's more of a kind of procedure talk. So for this audience, I guess um, w what I want to raise is this question of, um, okay, well, assuming that the FAA is all about contracts, um, it, is contract really the right um, frame uh, or paradigm for thinking about arbitration law, right? And, and the reason I say this is that often when I get into conversations with people about arbitration, they say, well, you know, it's not really agreed to. People are not really consenting. Uh, they're form contracts. They don't really have a choice. Uh, and of course, this dovetails with a lot of kind of very well-established uh, critiques going back to Arthur Leff uh, about um, uh, uh, form contracts and uh, the lack of real meaningful consent. And um, I think a lot of the arbitration debate has been reduced to this issue of consent and contract. And I think that that's kind of missing the point. I think that contracts are really standing in as a proxy for our concerns about procedure and procedural fairness in arbitration. And um, I think states understand that. States have regulated arbitration procedure for a very long time, but because of FAA preemption, those regulations don't stick. Now, um, so what do I mean by this, that, that contract is, is not maybe the right lens? So I'll give you a couple of examples. So the Arbitration Fairness Act that we just talked about is essentially trying to regulate um, procedure, right? It's saying we are skeptical that the procedure in arbitration is going to be fair to people like consumers and employees. And we want to protect them uh, because we don't think they have the kind of bargaining power to really craft fair procedures. Uh, and we also think that, you know, for civil rights and antitrust claims, uh, the arbitration procedure is not adequate. But largely the way that the Arbitration Fairness Act deals with it is, is to, to kind of single out types of contracts where there's unfair bargaining power. And that unfairness becomes a proxy for regulating procedure, right? Uh, another famous case that people may know about is the Hooters case, Hooters versus Phillips, where Hooters had an internal arbitration program that was just manifestly unfair. In fact, the AAA and other arbitration organizations came in and said, this is not even arbitration because it doesn't even meet minimum due process standards. And instead of kind of addressing the procedural issue, which was at the heart of that case, the court said, you know what, 
Um, because Hooters developed this process that really isn't what we would think of as arbitration, they breached the contract. And so the, the paradigm of analysis shifts from procedure to contract. And this is very much, I think, the, the situation that we're in now. And I think, um, so, so one problem with that, I think, is that it, it's not the right issue. It, we're using a proxy for something different. And I think that has consequences. So one of the consequences is that we're putting too much pressure on the unconscionability doctrine. Right? And the slide I wanted to show you is one that maybe some of you have seen before. It's um, uh, Andrew Brühl has done some studies and uh, Susan Randall has done some studies about the way that unconscionability uh, doctrine has really just been kind of um, overused, perhaps. And there are actually statistics showing that um, um, unconscionability uh, uh, arguments succeed in, uh, I don't know if I can bring this up, but uh, succeed in, so, so this is kind of a, well, it's not even the right proportion, I don't know how uh, to, to do this, but um, uh, that unconscionability uh, 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 claims are being raised in arbitration clauses far more than they are in other types of clauses, uh, and that they succeed at m like du double the rate uh, that they do uh, when they're asserted against other kinds of clauses. And this, of course, raises the suspicion that has been voiced for the past 10, 15 years that judges are secretly hostile to arbitration. They're using this vague, manipulable doctrine um, to express that hostility, right? And, and, and uh, defense lawyers have been making this argument for the past 10 or 20 years, and lo and behold, the result of that is concepcion, right? The idea that the unconscionability standard in Discover Bank was secretly hostile towards arbitration. And you can see concepcion as a response to the overburden that, or the pressure that we're putting on the unconscionability doctrine to do things that it really was not designed to do. We're using it to regulate procedure in this kind of backward way, and I think that has ripple effects uh, that are not necessarily all positive, and I think Concepcion is a good example of that. So anyway, um, I, I, I do want to leave some time for people to kind of engage, so I'm going to stop there um, and um, leave it at that. You can hear me without the mic, right? No one has ever had a problem hearing me. I did have some questions for the panel, but I too want to allow the audience to ask questions first. So, questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, picking up on the point that both Benjamin and, and Milo made, um, commenting from a European perspective, yeah. we generally disallow arbitration clauses in consumer contracts. Yeah. Um, and and um, a consumer, has, however you define it, but a consumer would only be uh, legally able to agree to arbitration once a dispute has arisen. So you can never hide it away in, in boilerplate. You know, it, it always must be something that the consumer positively, uh, uh, positively affirms. And I think that will probably address the, the, the issues that you have raised. And we leave it in a, in a broader context in general, unfair contract terms legislation. On the other hand, um, the European Union has started launching programs to actually increase consumer arbitration, to uh, make it more attractive for the consumer not to go to court, but to go to more expert, quicker, uh, low-cost panels. But again, this trend the consumer can only agree to once the dispute um, has arisen. Um, and um, that was maybe more of a, more of a comment. What, what, what Caio said, nothing about Brazilian law, so I have to uh, apologize in advance for my lack of knowledge. Uh, but the one thing that I keep reading, and I'm, I'm, I'm a conflict person, so I look at private international law, mm -hmm. the one thing I keep reading about Brazilian law, they do not allow choice of law. So in a contract in Brazil, apparently, if I'm not mistaken, you cannot choose the law to apply to the contract. How does that go hand in hand with any attempt to opting out of a state court and, and going, going to arbitration? If you can't even choose the law, then how can you choose the dispute? Yes, uh, in fact, we, we're now recently developing this uh, freedom of contract, freedom of choice of law, and uh, we can Sorry, we're recently developing this uh, costume and this uh, practice and legal understanding that 
uh, one can choose, that the parties can choose uh, their jurisdiction and there are applicable laws. Is it, is, is, it is true that we cannot, uh, we are not able, we're still not able and probably will not be f uh, for long since our civil code, uh, civil code does not allow it to choose to choose another jurisdiction that which is foreigner uh, only in arbitration arbitration will be the only asp and the only uh, resolution method where you can choose uh, a foreigner jurisdiction to to apply to uh, but nowadays during uh, in arbitration that's already uh, it's already very good uh, consolidated that you have this freedom of choice and uh, foreigner arbitration awards are pretty much pretty much enforceable that's why we try to to match this this interpretation to dispute resolution boards and other kinds of ADR that you can bring to the same understanding Well, you know, the, so, so some groups like the AAA have tried to regulate arbitration procedure in consumer and employment um, uh, disputes. You know, what I've tried to do is to, to uh, articulate what I think of as some of the procedural values that are underpinning the FAA that have perhaps been a little bit overlooked. Um, but, you know, this was kind of what I was trying to say in my response to your presentation the last time, which is, I think I agree with you, right? So I think if everything becomes about consent, the, 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 the risk is that we get the consent, but we have a really shitty, pro oh, sorry, <laughs> but, you know, awful process that really doesn't comport with the legitimacy of the institution. So. Next question. I have to put my CUNY law hat on. Um, in summary, what we've heard here is a discussion of dispute resolution by private contract. And one of the problems that I see across the board that maybe Brazil does correctly is try to balance out uneven bargaining power. Because in, as from what I understand from what you said about the Brazilian Civil Code, you can't opt out of certain things. That you, you can't really have a mechanism of private dispute resolution with, without the courts getting involved. And in this country, at least the facade is that if there is justice to be had, you can have it in court, as opposed to do arbitration or do privately um, order dispute resolution. So I would like each of the panelists to give a, a second or two, not a second, but a minute or two thought to um, how they think that uneven bargaining power affects what they've talked about in terms of dispute resolution and whether or not they're as in favor of this privately decided dispute resolution as they were. And for Professor Pomerantz, who discussion was really about a situation where there's a lot of uneven bargaining power. I ask you, well, what do you think um, the answer should be if not unconscionability? Because unconscionability is being stretched here. So what are the alternatives? 
Well, if, if we take out unconscionability entirely from the equation, um, there are, of course, other equitable doctrines that you could potentially look to in, in these cases. But if you go beyond the equitable doctrines entirely, and, and you try and find more concrete things on, on, which, to, on, on which to pin this, I, I think one of the things that has to be looked at very closely would be the FAA's role in some of these cases. Because right now, it seems like, at least in the, the nursing home context, people are sort of being backed into a corner of arguing unconscionability because anything else, it seems, is being preempted by the FAA. And I, I think in, it, until that is changed, or if that is changed, you're going to keep seeing unconscionability showing up as the primary argument leveraged to, uh, to have these contracts not be enforced. So my two cents, I, I think we latch on to the unfair bargaining issue because we have this assumption that arbitration is inherently more unfair than a judicial process. And if you look at the history, in the 1920s, arbitration was thought of as more just than the courts. The courts were simply not working. That's why we had the whole procedural reform movement, right? So. And, and many practitioners now would say, well, arbitration actually is fair. Actually, some of the empirical studies actually confirm that. So to me, the real issue, again, is about procedure and not about contract. Yeah, so as we have, as we have demonstrated, uh, Brazil is still developing the, the use of arbitration in other ADRs. So our speech is basically, most of times, uh, still, still very arbitration forward. So, so very arbitration favorable, and um, because Brazil is, we're we're still already flooded with very protective measures to judicial systems and, and consumers, laborers. So everything about that is just uh, for us is just unimaginable in arbitration. So we're still we're already very flooded with all of this. Um, counter arbitration uh, point of view, sort of speech. From now on, from from forever on, is still arbitration forward. Still, um, and we don't think that our legal system will allow uh, any uneven, uneven uh, contracts and uneven bar bargain power, as the others have commented. So we, it's not our actual worry for us right now. This this unbalance between the parties because. Uh, our legal system is already too protective, is already too conservative. Our, our uh, whole line of thought is very forward, very pro-arbitration. Uh, maybe Daniel may disagree, but we'll see. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, just to, uh, actually, uh, uh, our law, Brazilian law uh, forbids arbitration involving uh, employment law and consumer law. Now there is a reform, uh, a paper, a bill of law that wants to change it. Uh, uh, for the same, I think, European Union that you can uh, agree to arbitrate after the dispute has arisen. And employment law for uh, high level executives and stuff like that, but not for uh, common employees. So I don't think it's a concern because. Uh, we, do, we don't face this kind of problem, like bargaining problem. Courts, when you, if you want to set aside an award, if you go to court, the court will comply and annul the award according to our arbitration law. Because, as Kai have said, uh, Brazil, Brazilian, the Brazilian courts are too protective of the the weak weak party. I suppose I can weigh in since everybody else did. I would just say that uh, I question the initial point that uh, unconscionability is being leveraged too heavily, not because I question it, I think it probably is, but because uh, the empirical point is a good one. Is arbitration really less favorable on balance than other uh, dispute resolution systems? There's good reason to believe it might not be. And then the question of what you would do to regulate procedure matters for sure, but I, I posit as a, a, a possibility, I'm not arguing that it's the case, but that we see a lot of disparate party arbitration not because we want to take advantage of other unfair processes in arbitration, but because 
large commercial parties want to avoid the costs of aggregative litigation, right? They want to get away from class actions. And so if you take away class actions, if you were to embrace uh, my proposal and say that parties could potentially uh, negotiate for class action waivers in litigation as well, I'm not sure that you would see the same, and I think there's some empirical reason to believe this, I'm not sure you would see the same disparate party mandatory arbitration problem. I think that parties might very well be willing to let their cases be heard in court, taking away that aggregative litigation hammer. I think that that winds up creating a lot of pressure. It, it, it's very expensive for parties, and there's a lot of problem with aggregative litigation. If we were to fix that or allow parties to do things about that, I don't know that you'd see the disparate uh, outcomes arbitration versus litigation. It might relieve some of the problem anyway. I want to thank the panelists and thank the audience for attending. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're, 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 you're,